Do you want to let us know when we're live, please? Okay. Well, we're live, so <laughs> we'll start the meeting. So welcome, everyone, in present and watching online. Um, well, welcome to this meeting of the Staffing and Employment Committee. My name's Councillor Henry Batchelor, and I'm the chair of the committee. Can everyone please present in the chamber? Note that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast at some point. So do keep in mind what is on your screen and on your desks. Uh, the camera follows the microphone being switched on, so council, councillors and officers are advised to wait a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up. And can those participating in the meeting via the live stream indicate that you wish to speak via the chat column? Please do not use the chat column for any other purpose than indicating a wish to speak. Please make sure that your device is fully charged and that you switch your microphone off unless you're invited to do so. Please ensure that you're switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they do not interrupt proceedings. And that goes for members in the room as well. Um, please use a headset where possible when speaking and hold the microphone close to your mouth. And when you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. When you've finished addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately. Speak slowly and clearly, and please do not talk over or interrupt anybody else. Um, members, please note if we need to vote on any item, we shall do so via the microphones, via the voting system on there, and only those present in the chamber today will be able to cast a vote. Um, committee members present, I now ask each of you to introduce yourselves. Members, after I call your name, please, turn, or please hit the microphone, introduce yourself, and which ward you represent. So as I say, my name is Councillor Henry Batchelor, I represent the Linton Ward, and I'm the chair of the committee, and uh, standing in as vice chair today, Councillor Claire Daunton. Hello, I'm Claire Daunton, and I'm one of the members for the Fenditton and Fulbourne Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Sally Ann Hart. Hi, I'm Sally Ann Hart, and I'm one of the members for the Melbourne Ward. And welcome to the committee. It's your first meeting, so welcome. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mark Howell, please. Thank you, Chairman. My name is Mark Howell, and I represent the Acton and Catholic Ward. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Good afternoon, Chairman. Heather Williams, and I represent the Wardens Ward. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Councillor John Williams. Hi, I'm Councillor John Williams. I'm one of the councillors for Fendin and Fulbourne. Thank you very much. Uh, I can confirm the meeting is court, so we shall continue. Um, officers online and in the room, I'm now going to ask you to unmute and introduce yourselves, please. Uh, we usually have Head of HR and Corporate Services, Susan Gardner Craig, with us assisting the meeting, but she is unavailable today. So I believe we have two other officers. Um, firstly, Jonathan Corbett. Are you there, Jonathan? Hello, yes, sir. Jonathan Corbett, HR advisor. All right, thank you very much. And also, Donya Taylor. Yep, Donya Taylor, HR advisor. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll start with the agenda then, members. Those are all the housekeeping. So I think we'll start with item number one. Apologies. Oh, sorry, Patrick, I haven't introduced you. <laughs> Sincere apologies, my friend. Uh, we have uh, Patrick Adams. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? I'm Patrick Adams, Democratic Services Officer and Parking Related. And uh, for apologies, we've had apologies from Councillor Dawn Percy. Thank you very much. Nothing personal, Patrick. Um, item number two, members, declarations of interest. Do any members have any interest to declare? Any items on the agenda? Can't see any, so we'll take that as no. Um, and then move on to item number three, minutes of the previous meeting, which begin on page one of the agenda. Members that were present at the meeting, are there any glaring errors or omissions here? Nope. Okay, so we'll take those as a true record. And we'll move on to the items on the agenda, which is item number four, the disciplinary policy review. Uh, Donya, I believe you're presenting this, is that right? Um, unfortunately, no. Um, the disciplinary policy review is um, from another HR advisor. Um, I've not got that prepared for today. Okay. Um, apologies you, on that. Sorry, Councillor Batchelor. I, I don't have a summary. But, um, I spoke to Chloe Whitehead, who is the HR advisor, which revised the policy. I have a short statement to accompany that, I, if I may read it. Sorry, I, was, I wasn't clear. So you're going to read out a statement from another officer who prepared the report, I've is got, that right? I've got a summary of the changes that were made um, and the reasons for them, if that would be helpful okay. in her absence. 
that would be. But um, yeah, if any members have any questions about the report, um, presumably there's no one here we can ask those of. I would certainly be happy to to um, speak to Chloe afterwards and, and get her to provide feedback. But if you'd prefer that Chloe to be here um, to answer those questions, um, unfortunately she's not here today. Mm. So obviously we're being asked to uh, approve this document today. Obviously, if there's any questions of clarity that we need clarified before this is approved, we're gonna we're gonna struggle without some assistance from officers, I'm afraid. So. I'll tell you what, if, if you read out the report, you read out the, um, the introduction that you have from, from Chloe, and obviously if there are any questions of clarity, we'll have to make a decision about what to do about that afterwards. So if you want to press on, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, so the, the disciplinary policy um, was reviewed by Chloe Whitehead and the HR team. Um, the summary of the main changes are as follows. Um, the policy has been brought in line with the new council structure, so the references to old term terminology and terms have been reviewed so it's updated so it reflects how the council is currently arranged. Um, the, one of the main changes is that we've moved from um, four disciplinary levels to three to reduce confusion and align processes. It should help to provide a more consistent approach and support managers to make outcome decisions more easily. And further, we have an update to the list of proposed offences under each level of the new disciplinary policy. These are guidelines only, but will help managers decide what a level an offence sits at uh, if they need to decide that as part of their investigation. Um, so I'd like to obviously invite any questions that anyone may have, but uh, that, that's, the, that's the conclusion of the summary. Okay, thank you very much. Obviously, I appreciate this isn't penned by yourself, but if you, know, if you do your best in answering the questions for us, that will be appreciated. Um, we do have a question from Councillor Howell, first of all. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, if you don't mind, I'll turn to page 18 and the level of offences is what I'm interested in. Um, so if, for example, you've got minor offences, and, and you, you have very helpfully, well, so I don't know if they are how helpful these will be. Failure to observe, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, I've still got this thing on. Uh, failure to observe confidentiality. Now, if I was to break a confidentiality, shall I say, in my opinion, a minor way, that would be a level one. So I was to say something which, in all intents and purposes, is quite small. But also, failure to observe confidentiality could be quite catastrophic for mm -hmm. the organization or for an individual. Now, would that be gross misconduct under level three, or does that still stay under level one? Where, do, where does something like that go? And, I, and I, while you're thinking of that, I'll just bring up a failure to record hospitality. It's one thing for a housing officer to have um, a box of chocolates because they've helped somebody with regards to a particular tricky situation, which helps, which, which I was happy with, and they record that. It's another thing to accept a holiday in Barbados because they've done something as well. So we're, we're, I'm sorry, I'm trying to look at the nuances of what happens here. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, so I suppose I think the question is um, sort of who, de who determines or what determines the level of uh, offence of each of these items. So, you know, who, what would be the criteria for determining what a, um, a level three breach of con confidentiality would be compared to a level one and the same question around levels of hospitality received? I don't suppose. Is there a response there? I think I could, could answer that, yes. I think that in terms of, um, the, obviously they're guidelines, but the way that it would be looked at is every investigation would be approached with, you know, without any uh, preconceptions of, of, of the outcome. We'd want to look at whether there were perhaps a, a breach of confidentiality might have been accidental or it could have been deliberate. If it's something that someone has done deliberately, that would sit, um, for me, if I was advising an investigative manager at a higher level, than, than something that perhaps might be accidentally. So we would want to take into account all of the circumstances of a particular case. And I think that would apply for, for both of those um, elements of uh, both of the things that have been raised about hospitality and for, um, you know, for, for confidentiality breach of, breach of that. Okay, so it would be a subjective decision made by the, the decision maker who's, you know, judging how severe the offence is. I, th I think it would, would need to be based on all other policies. It's obviously just, we would need to look at what policies we currently have in place in, in each of those areas and see, you know, has somebody followed those 
the things that we currently have in place, the guidelines, or has somebody completely acted outside of that and has completely disregarded it? That would also take it at a high level as well. Okay. Do you want to come back, Councillor Hayes? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, and, I, and I'm sorry I'm putting you into an awkward position here. Um, um, but uh, I just, if we, I just think what we, I'm, I'm always very uncomfortable when with, with these type of situations. So, for example, in Serious Two, I can cause damage or injury to a person or property, um, and that is a, 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 a level two, which is bullet point four, and then under gross misconduct, fighting or assaulting is obviously a gross misconduct. And it, it, it's just, I find these difficult sometimes. And I, so I suppose my question is, coming back, you said that the, the person who is, um, who, the, the person who decides what level the, this is, is that then the decision maker with regards to the outcome of any disciplinary procedure that takes place on that individual? So that means that person is like the judge and the jury then, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what would happen in that circumstance? The investigating manager would make a determination based on the policy and HR advice. It would then be presented to a hearing manager, so someone at a higher level, a more senior manager, um, and and they would, you know, they would present that case to that more senior manager, who would make the decision in line with the policy and and HR advice. In in both cases, the HR advisor for the hearing manager and the investigating manager would be separate people. Um, so there would there would not be any um, any conflict there. Okay. So we, on, thank you very much. That's fine. Thank thank you. So in essence, there's two levels of decision making before anything goes forward formally. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you, um, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if some additional wording might help with the, the potential conflict there. So a minor offence could be classified as accidental. Um, with, with particular need for confidentiality if it was accidental, I mean, you could have a higher level for if it was deliberate, because you can see that the words deliberate acts of theft, deliberate or malicious serious damage. So whether we need to replicate that in relation to confidentiality, because I think that's something that is really important, particularly for the organisation that we are, means that we have a lot of people's personal data and casework mm. and things like that. So that's my first point. My other is on the count the bullet points, I'm sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six, um, serious misconduct, the bullying or harassing the member staff or the public, I would be inclined to think that that is gross misconduct. So I'm wondering if that, why that's down as a serious level of uh, misconduct, so a level two, not a level three, because um, it might not necessarily be physical, but we know that you know, we should be, and we are, supposed to be committed to stamping out bullying so I would expect to see that at the highest level. Okay. Thank well, you Chairman. I think there's two questions there so the first one being is it worth trying to uh, sort of classify the levels of breach within each level so if uh, there's a minor level of confidentiality breach compared to a, a gross level of um, confidentiality breach and I suppose that would be the same for all the all the offences listed in the in the document. Um, and I think the second question is whether how sort of strongly we rate bullying or harassing members of staff or the public. I think there's a question about whether that should be gross or serious misconduct. Do you have any comments there? I can certainly take um, those, you know, take that back to, to Chloe to clarify exactly where something would sit. I think that we have um, the disciplinary policy would not stand on its own just for um, issues of. Um, you know, bullying and harassment. We also have the dignity at work policy as well, and that would help us to, to clarify a, a nature of offence. So it wouldn't just be that, but I'm happy to clarify on why something is classed as a, a you know a, a lower level rather than being just gross misconduct. Okay, you want to come back? Um, yes. So my my question was slightly different in that is there anything to stop us today? Obviously, we're looking at this policy in moving the bullying and harassment and member of staff or the public, as councillors, do we have the ability to move that into a level three? Or is it something that's governed house? Because if so, I would like to move that it goes to a level three. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. So I'll ask officers first, then what, what, is, what are your views then on moving one of these items from level two to level three um, breach? I'll ask that question first. 
I, I think, I, I suppose from, from the perspective of making something that would be a gross misconduct offence, that's automatically gross misconduct and that somebody could be dismissed for it, that always would carry a more significant risk for the council as an employer if we were to be challenged at that um, in an employment tribunal. So there's an element of that. And I, I don't want to, to prejudge why something is at that certain level, but um, that would be something that we would certainly want to consider whether, you know, such a, you know, a, a move resulting in somebody being dismissed could, could result in higher risk for, for the council as a whole. But um, that would be the one thing that, that, that okay. comes to my mind, just looking at the, how that would be phrased. Yeah, and actually, I've just sort of read on into the level threes gross misconduct, and I see there is a point in there: repeated or severe bullying or harassment of a member of staff or public. So I think that is actually there are actually two definitions: one in level two, one in level three. Does that is that better? Does that clarify? Um, personally, I think bullying and harassment is not acceptable at on any level or form. So for myself, there is no distinction. People are bullied to the point of suicide sometimes, and what that's what one person can see as a minor thing. Um, so it needs stamping out. So that's my preference would be to have it at level three. Okay. Bullies should be dismissed. Okay. Um, Councillor Howe, you wanted to. On a different matter entirely now. Okay. Councillor Donnelly wants to. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think Councillor um, Heather Williams is um, missing the point of, of this, to be honest. Um, these, this policy has been drawn up with regard to um, a number of um, issues, um, least of which is experience as well as um, legal and uh, HR um, expertise. And these are examples. It says in the document, no, these are examples only. And I think Councillor Heather Williams is trying to be very prescriptive and to um, sort of tie us down to a policy which restricts our ability to be able to take each case on its merits or its, on, on, on its um, evidence. Um, this is not the purpose of this, plan, of, of this disciplinary policy. This disciplinary policy is to broadly set out the ways in which this council will pursue um, disciplinary matters. It's not to actually be prescriptive and instruct officers what they should do at each point in a disciplinary process. It is very subjective. It always has to be subjective. And therefore, you know, that is why there has been an attempt here to indicate to us the levels, the sorts of um, misconduct that would, have, would be considered in each of the levels. But it doesn't mean that it will be definitely that level that will be pursued for that particular misconduct because every every incident has to be judged independent and we should be giving officers as much leeway as possible within a disciplinary process to enable them to take forward the correct disciplinary action to be taken for a particular event. So I would not agree to making any amendments to this. Thank you. Opportunity to come back. I think the Councillor Heather Williams has uh, something to say in response. Thank you. Um, and then I'll, I'll give way, as it were. Um, so moving it from level two to level three, we, it says action may lead to dismissal. We're not being prescriptive in that that's the only thing. It still gets judged on a case-by-case -case basis. Nothing would change in that. Um, but as you say, it gives more leeway and it gives a message that actually there are some cases of bullying which we do not consider as serious, as, as serious enough to be gross misconduct. Rather than giving a clear message 
that we are against bullying of any kind. I don't think we should be having a policy that gives leeway to bullying, um, personally. If it's level three as a, a classification and just left there, it will still be investigated. People still have to go through that case-by-case -case process. It's not about taking away or people unjustifiably being dismissed. And a level three does not necessarily mean dismissal either. But I think to declassify it as it's been and to give a signal that bullying and harassment is a level two offence, is completely inappropriate and is not acceptable. So I still maintain it should be level three only. And then those case by case might show that it's not, but I don't want to give any leeway. Thank you. Okay, so I will continue with the debate and obviously I'll come back to you if you do want to move that. Is it Councillor Howell? Councillor Howell, please. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, I'm on a com completely different matter. Yep, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, Chairman, um, so there's two issues. With regard to page 24, um, the suspension during investigation, uh, there's a turn of phrase here, which although understandable, does raise a certain alarm here. Uh, the, uh, the final paragraph, the HR team must be consulted for an individual suspended from work, and the member of the HR team should or fair enough be present at the suspension meeting. That's fine. Where due to service, where due to service reasons this is not possible, Right. So, is, does that mean if somebody's position is so vital that we can't suspend them, or or, or what? Um, or because it, it seems to be a, the first paragraph says um, if the HRM should be present, uh, should be present. So I understand that if you've got to suspend somebody and the HR is not present, that's fine. So then the second part seems to either duplicate it or say, or, or and I might be reading this wrong. Um, be, sometimes we can't suspend somebody because of their job is so vital. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not quite sure on that paragraph. That's what I want a bit of clarity on. Okay, okay so I, I thought I'll go on to my next point if you don't yeah, mind. Please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so on the page 25 before uh, 10, the disciplinary hearing, the, the paragraph above, it says that it is likely the manager will not be able to inform the individual of all the details surrounding the reason for suspension. Well, that seems a little bit unfair that you don't know all the reasons you've been suspended. I think that's a bit, you know, you've been suspended, but I don't know why. I mean, so that, that I find unfair. And then if you turn over onto page 26, all parties will be involved. Um, sorry, the second paragraph down on page 26. Supporting documents must be available to all parties involved no less than three working days before the date of the meeting. So the... Um, HR will have knowledge of everything for however long it takes before the you're in, and that may be a week or two weeks, however long. But the actual individual who has been suspended, or not been suspended, but is still up for discipline, they won't know until three days before what is actually all the documents and when they'll actually be told. I think that's an imbalance that we need to look at, and I think this is incorrect. I think. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so I think there are three questions there. Um, Jonathan, so the first one on the bottom of page 24, just some clarity around the final paragraph. Uh, page 25, again, some clarity around the, um, the manager not being able to inform individual details of a suspension. Just, I think, just a bit of explanation around that would be useful. And then, again, the reason for the, uh, the perceived imbalance between the Human Resources Department and the party involved in the amount of time that documents are made available to both on page 26. So, yeah, anything you can do to help clarify those would be useful. Okay, thank you. Um, I think in relation to the to the first question about um, where suspension is it possible, I would need to clarify on the wording because it may just be that it's the way in which it's worded that, that give, gives that impression. Um, so I want to want to be absolutely clear on that, um, so I understand exactly what why it's phrased in in, in that way. Um, in relation to the second question about the manager not informing uh, the individual all the reasons for suspension, um, I think because at the time that somebody is suspended, the investigation may not have been fully completed. It's something that will be that's done at the very start because the reason we would suspend someone is there's the potential risk of such an event happening again or um, the, the event that they could 
potentially disrupt an investigation. Um, so that, that's why we would say, we would, I would say that we'd give someone the reason that we're doing investigation and, and be able to state you know, the, the reason for it. Um, but then we would obviously follow up with uh, written confirmation with the allegation um, after that. And then in relation to the uh, point 26 about the um, all that the documentation is available to the party three days before, I believe that that's currently the, that hasn't changed from the previous policy. It's, that's what it was. And that's what we've been working to under the, under the previous version. Um, I think that um, we would only ever, in, in terms of, um, sometimes it's <clears throat> only possible to get the information done at a certain time. Three days is uh, the time that we would give somebody a notice for any meeting and therefore, uh, you know, certainly an investigation meeting would be, would be three days. And because it's a, um, a during the course of uh, a formal hearing, the packing information would always be sent to them um, at least five days beforehand as well. So um, I think that, you know, if, if it's a case that we need to, there's a recommendation to bring everything in line um, because you would want to give somebody at least five working days beforehand, that's something we can certainly look at. Chairman, if come back. Mind, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, with regards to page 24, the last paragraph, thank you for looking at that. Um, with regards to page 25, the final paragraph, um, I, I understand where you're coming from. I might not agree with that, but I understand where you're coming from. But with regards to the three working days, then I suppose my question is, can you guarantee me that both sides will only have three working days? Um, because otherwise it seems to be unfair that the HR department have had or have knowledge of or been able to work on this for quite a while. And then the, shall we say the word defendant, the member of staff who's been suspended or has, to, has only got three days. And it's not, I don't think it's, a, it's an equal. I think it should be equal. That's all I'm asking. Or the member of staff is given a longer period of time. I mean, if you've you both got three days, then okay. But, you know, all the member of staff should be given more period of time to prepare for what could be uh, a loss of job at the ultimate um, penalty. Any thoughts there, Jonathan? I, I think that sometimes because of the, of the course of investigation, the HR department might not have all the information until fairly late in the investigation. As soon as all that information is to hand, the employee will be sent a copy, whether that's the report and and all of the other evidence. So, um, you know, because the investigation is ongoing and we'll collate evidence throughout of it, we wouldn't necessarily have everything the employee sees until pretty much the same time that the employee sees. So I don't know if the, um, you know, the difference in timing would be would be significant. I'm so sorry, Chairman, I, I can't accept that. But you, I think if you know when this hearing is going to be, you should have the day before. And I think, I think three days is too short. I'm asking for a level playing field from the member of staff that's all I'm asking for, and I think a couple more days, because it's not only them, the member of staff, they might have to get a union official in, they might have to um, uh, get another member of staff to come in to support them, they might have to get other people in, witnesses, I, I don't know what they want to do, but I just think three days is a short period of time for them, they might have to call somebody who's not a South Cam's employee, who then have to take time off work, and maybe that's not possible. So I, I, I just think the three days is, is, not a, um, is too short of a period. Chairman, um, I think this is a consultation document. Is that correct? Is this or is this a final? Is this a, are we are we consultating on this? Uh, I think we've been asked to approve the changes to this document. Yeah. Well, so on that particular one, then I, I'm asking for a change. I'm asking for five working days. Okay. Again. Okay. Okay. Donia, yeah, did you want to come in? Yeah, I just I just wanted to add what Jonathan's already what's already mentioned. Um, in terms of the disciplinary policy, everything that Chloe um, has uh, put in and tried to align does match up to the ACAS guidance. Um, so with regards to dis disciplinary uh, meetings and things like that, so the three days notice is something um, that um, that is that is that is the standard practice. I hear what you're saying in terms of. Um, you, there's there's a potential imbalance where you may have a employee knowing um, knowing uh, little information until late on in the game, and then what can they do to uh, defend themselves in, in that kind of terminology? 
what I would say is if, for instance, you were to arrange a disciplinary meeting, and if we're looking at the worst case scenario, which could be gross misconduct, um, and if the employee, again, worst case scenario, was suspended and then was only given uh, and was given notice of the meeting at the time is specified in the policy, if they were to then um, get the letter um, and know that the meeting's happening, and if they wanted to bring someone and that person wasn't able to make it, um, then they would then communicate that to the um, to the person that's hearing the meeting, and we would then look at um, at either alternative representation, so whether or not it would be like a, a written representation from another person, or whether or not we would look at rearranging the date. If an employee said, actually, I really need to make you aware of this, and I can't do it because it's too short notice for the meeting to happen, I would say it unless it, you're talking about a meeting that's been rearranged on like four or five separate occasions already, um, that the council would take the, uh, it would be giving the employee the benefit of the doubt in order to mitigate the risk uh, from a um, employment law point of view. I don't know if that helps um, kind of clarify. I, co I completely hear what you're saying in terms of the imbalance, and I understand that. But what I wouldn't want to say is we'd, we've the union agreement's already been been given, I understand, and the guidance meets the ACAS guidance. So if we were to look at it being five days, that would be um, that would be more generous, and that's that's all I would say. Um, I hope that helps explain it. Okay. We'll come back. Thank you, Chairman. I'll crop you a tenner. <laughs> Sorry about that. Donna Marie, you just cost me ten pounds. I'll speak to you soon. Of my daughter. Thank you, Chairman. Sorry about that. I do apologise. Um, I understand that. I, um, thank you very much indeed. And I'm sure there is a sensible um, solution to many of these situations, especially if somebody couldn't make it. it it's just what concerns me. I think the, the biggest thing that concerns me is that, and it's already been explained by, by Jonathan, how you can't, when somebody's suspended, sometimes they're not given the full reason. And then all the documents can be prepared and given to them with three days before. So only then do they find out three days before the hearing, what the whole reason is that they've been suspended, or not suspended, but there will be a hearing about their behaviour. So I'm, that's what I'm concerned about. They've only then got three days to prepare, because only then do they find out exactly why they were going to a disciplinary panel. And that is my concern. Now, I understand that you, I, I can't see it. You, maybe you could point that out to me, where it says that this is a following ACAS or in discussion with the unions. But that is my particular bugbear on this one. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. No problem. I will take the other speakers, but obviously there have been a few requests for changes, so I will come back to those both at the end. Um, but I will carry on with the other speakers. Did you want to come in on that point, Council? Yeah, on, on, the, on the points that Councillor Howard made, I mean, and quite right, it's been said by the officer, that this is this follows ACAS and also follows the agreement that we have with the trade unions, and also, you know, if it, we have to be mindful that um, if it was unreasonable, if we did give the defendant unreasonable time, that that would then be taken into account should it go to a tribunal. So we wouldn't wish to do that. Um, but three days, you know, I understand where you're coming from, but it is what has been agreed. It was the policy of this council. You know, this is not something that's been changed. It's not part of the document that's been changed. But it's certainly an agreement that we have with the, with the trade unions and, with, and follows ACAS guidance. So to put something else there could jeopardize us going forward. So I wouldn't want to do that. And on the other point about uh, suspension, I, I interpret this as the HR team not being present due to service reasons, not, not, um, not the individual uh, being suspended due to service reasons, um, due to service reasons. I mean, it's... Um, you know, it, the paragraph in which it sits talks about the HR team being consulted 
and a member of the HR team being present at the suspension meeting where due to service reasons this is not possible, i.e. the HR person cannot be at, the, at that meeting rather than not suspending the person. That's how I read it. Chairman, very, very brief. I, I think I was told it was changed, and that's my concern. The three days? I think it was. I think that's what Jonathan says, but I'm not going to hold him to that. Yeah. Just, Jonathan, just, clarity. Yeah, but very quick bit of clarity. The three days, was that already in the existing document, or has that been changed for this document we're looking at today? Well, that was in the existing document, the one before okay. this Thank was you. revised. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to move on now, so Claire, yeah, I need to be very patient. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, actually, my first question was to do with that. And I think it would have been helpful if we had had a list of what had been changed mm -hmm. from the existing document to this document, and I think it would still be helpful to have that. Um, that's my first point. Um, and, and leading on from that, um, on page five, um, it says that the disciplinary policy has been uh, changed to um, take account of new ways of working. Now, I'm not sure if it does take account of the post-COVID ways of working, and I'd just like some assurance on that. Um, uh, does it really, has that been factored in? And for example, on page 18, or it, I'm looking now and of course I can't find the actual point, um, but it mentioned somewhere about lateness or persistent lateness. Well, how, how are we measuring that uh, with homeworking and increased flexibility? So it's a rather general point, but I'd like some reassurance that the new post-COVID working arrangements have been taken into account in the review of the policy. Does one of the officers want to respond? Jonathan? Um, in, in, in terms of the um, different ways of working post-COVID, obviously one of the things that has been introduced relatively recently is our new HR system, so that we allow uh, employees to um, record their time directly onto the system. So managers have the ability to, you know, based on um, contact to monitor what uh, the hours that the employee is working. And I think the, the message that has come out from um, um, you know, different officers, senior officers within the council was that we very much, you know, whilst people are working from home, we do take um, that on, upon, you know, the hours that are recorded on trust. But if there are any issues with regards to, um, you know, being able to get hold of officers or, 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 you know, not being able to contact them at the times that they say that are available, then I think that we would, that would be the circumstance in which, you know, as such a a consideration of lateness would be brought on and, and investigated under the under the policy. Can I ask you a question? Well, yes, it does. But I, I would actually like some uh, reflection of that in this paper, um, both in the policy itself and in um, the introduction, to that we have assurance that that has been taken into account. I think that was just a comment, Jonathan. Okay. Um, Councillor Hart, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I've really enjoyed reading this document, I, I, I must admit, and I uh, feel pleased to see that it's been reviewed, bearing in mind it was last uh, issued or a new one in 2012. So I've got a few things, and some of them are very, very small. Um, um, first one is page 13. Just for consistency, I noticed that the spelling of offence there is with an S, and when later on it's with a C, when they talk about offence and offences, so I just think for consistency um, that might be helpful. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Better? Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, so that was just a, a, did you catch that or do you want to say that again? Sorry. No, it's fine. It's so, more for the benefit of the people okay. not here. Oh, apologies, apologies. Um, so it's page 13, yes, yeah, so I've just, uh, we're just looking at the, the, the different sort of sources of that work. Um, I'm looking at page 15 and the last but one paragraph. Investigating managers in the HR team are able to reject a supporting colleague, colleague choice, if they believe there is a potential conflict of interest, I'm fine with that, or that the choice is inappropriate. And I, I, I don't really have shared meaning with the term inappropriate, so I'm just wondering if there might be, um, what, why a person might be deemed inappropriate. What are you looking for? Sorry. It's the last but one paragraph on page 15, starting investigating okay. managers. Um, 
Yeah, Donna, Donna. Yeah, yeah, I can answer that one. So, uh, so, I mean, the chances of it ever happening is so minute and rare. It, you know, it, it, it really doesn't happen often. The example that I can give you um, is um, that you might have a member of staff and they might have a member of their family might also be a member of the trade union and be a supporting colleague in that context. Um, and the um, employee might want that um, that individual to support them. Um, and uh, we might deem that, that that relationship is more of a familial relationship you, and you wouldn't have a family member supporting you in a meeting. You would only have a, a trade union um, or, a, or, a, or a, yeah, a yeah, trade union representative supporting you. Um, so it would be in that in that regard. But it, it happens. I mean, I don't think it's happened the whole time I've been here in the last four years, but it's written in the policy to say that it may happen um, equally if, for instance, you were doing a disciplinary investigation and um, and sort of, you know potentially looking at suspension and um, they the employee wants to bring someone along who might then um, be a witness in the investigation. Again, it's really like difficult to go through a hypothetical situation, but that would be another example where perhaps we might say, well, actually, we're going to be speaking to you individually and therefore you will need to find an alternative person. But it, it would be quite rare. Thank you for that clarifying everything. Uh, yeah, I just wonder if it might then be worth putting that in as an example, e.g. a family member or um, a witness in, in to the Do you want to feed that back, please, officers? Yeah, yeah we can, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Just a couple more, if that's okay. okay. Um, on the page 18 under the offences, so level one and level two, again, I picked up the process of potential duplication. But the third point down on level one says failure to record hospitality. And then the one, two, three, four, five, six, I think the, the last but one on level two says um, accepting hospitality without declaring. And they sound like the same to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I think this goes back to one of the points you're making at the start around subjectivity. So, but again, I will ask officers to clarify that if that's the, the right understanding. Yes, I think it is. Uh, it's trying to make the distinction between the different levels, and it's not um, yeah, intent to describe every single scenario. But yeah, I, I take what you mean, and there's there's a very there's a, it's similar, but um, I, perhaps something could be declared much much later than than it had been, or um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of a scenario, but um, you know, I don't think we have. You know, I, I can't think of a, a current and live example of that off the top of my head, unfortunately. Okay. Um, if we move on, I think Councillor Williams wanted to come back on that point. I, I was just going to say from a, a member's point of view that one of the um, examples may be that you can be offered hospitality of which you do need to record that you've been offered, even if you've not accepted it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the, the difference. So, for example, you can be offered a trip to Barbados if you don't tell somebody, that's a minor offence. But if you were to accept it and not tell anyone, then that I think that's the distinction. Okay. It is how it is for councillors, anyway. Indeed. Is that a fair um, scenario there in relation to officers? Jonathan? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the help. Councillor Hart. Yes, thank, thank you, Councillor Williams. Um, and on page 24, like uh, Councillor Mark Howell and Councillor John Williams, I, I've now gone to that last paragraph and, and read it <laughs> both ways. So I think that definitely needs firming up. I think, in thinking about it now, it's probably um, what you were say, saying, Councillor Howe, because it says that final, where due to service reasons this is not possible, HR should be informed as soon as possible thereafter. And I imagine that HR would already know if a member of, their, um, of the team couldn't be present. So I think it is. But I think that needs um, wording so it's clearer. Okay. And I think I've got one more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's all right. Um, and it's to do with um, the disciplinary hearing on page 25. And I'm just wondering when it says that the, um, the, the names of any witnesses to be called, that they, that they will be named to the person. Uh, what, what if it's, I couldn't find anything else in terms of the, the, the support for witnesses. If you know that you're going to be a, a witness, um, you're going to be called, and that the person who... Um, 
is uh, school defence is is going to know that you're a witness. What might that feel like for the witness? I'm not sure I understand the point. Okay, so um, it's the, the point is it, it, in terms of um, the notification of the disciplinary action, the person who the disciplinary action is being called against will know that the the names of the witnesses who are going to appear. And I'm just wondering what that might what happens for the witnesses in terms of support for them in those days before um, if the if the um, person isn't suspended and it's, it's just a comment I mean I'm mindful that this is um, a cast of um, guidelines anyway but I just just really wanted to so your question is about about confidentiality it. yeah uh, yeah well yes I'm thinking about what the support is if, if for for um, employees this document and if you think you're going to be asked to witness something and the, and obviously the person knows you're going to be a witness just what is what is the support mechanism for those those people okay I can understand um, officers is there any comment on that Yes, we, we do um, have the the support, I think, as part of the policy, the, the, the clause and, and the intention is in relation to the person being investigated. But if somebody has questions about the disciplinary process and what to expect as a witness at an investigation, the HR team is present to be able to explain that and to outline what will happen in terms of um, how things were going. Um, we, we would be here, you know, at, you know, as a way to, to guide someone about what to expect and uh, and, and any, any other questions they might have about the about the process. So there would always be support for a, a potential witness to any investigation. You know, between the time that they're called or they're invited to attend to to the day of the hearing itself. Okay, does that add some reassurance? Yeah, that's fine. I have got one more though, <laughs> and it's it's really to do with readability. And I think this is the first time it comes up on page uh, twenty-eight. Page 28, I believe. Yeah. And it refers to, uh, again, the, the last but one paragraph. Uh, please refer to the council's statement policy in relation to discretions under the LGPS, which I'm assuming is the local government pension scheme. So I'm just wondering if that, I don't think that term's been used earlier on in the do document, just if that could be. Well, I think it's just a comment around uh, explaining acronyms at the first point they appear in the report, if that's possible. Thank you. Thank you. Any more? No? Okay, thanks very much. Um, any further speakers? No? Okay. So I said I'll come back to the proposed changes that were asked for earlier, so we have no more Chairman, speakers. Chairman, with your permission, may I make a suggestion? Yes. Because there are quite a number of things here. So can we say that this could come back to us and we could have a bit of a more clarity on some of the points and some of the issues that we've raised and therefore we can hopefully pass it on the next meeting? Um, I don't have an issue with that immediately. I just want to ask officers, is there a time scale around this? Does this need to be approved before a certain date? Or would it be possible to bring this back with some of the amendments that we've discussed today? I'm sorry, I think I think it would be possible for it to come back. Yeah, there's no we have the current policy in place at the moment that's not it's not got an expiry date on it. So okay. um yeah. Okay, I will ask the uh, the committee committee members what do you what is the feeling here would people like to bring this back with some with the amendments and comments taken on board that we've made today or is everyone happy to proceed and uh, make a decision on this today if anyone has any thoughts councillor heatherington thank you um i think it's sensible for it to come back because particularly on one of the points it's about the wording and it being a bit ambiguous so that may be subjective so it'd be good to see see what wording it is to make sure that it does clear up all of our concerns. Mm. Um, so I would be supportive of, of bringing it back as it's not sort of claim limited. Okay. Uh, Councillor John Williams, please. Well, I'm quite happy for you, Chair, to, um, to take, you know, to, to discuss this with the officers and to ensure that the changes that the members want are, are taken on board uh, and uh, legal review to, to publish rather than waiting another three months for it to come back to yes. this committee. Indeed. Chairman, I would be happy to second that proposal. Okay. Good. With you and the Vice Chair, get your ball to look and you need your allowance. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ball's in our court then. <laughs> but, uh, okay, well, if everyone... Yes, indeed. If, um, if there's no aversion to that, then we'll take that as the decision, please, if that's okay. So we're not making a decision on this today, but we're going to send the report back for the comments to be taken on board, and then it will be signed off providing we're content uh, by myself and the Vice-Chair, Councillor John Tunstall.
Chair, I think it's only one issue where we, we seem to be in agreement on most things other than the one that I raised, so I don't know how you want to handle that. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, I'll tell you what, then. We'll, um, we'll take that now. So, Councillor Heather Williams made a proposal earlier in the meeting regarding the bullet points and some changes regarding the various levels. You just want to explain that again, please, Councillor, what exactly you're proposing? Um, yeah, we, so there was two areas. One was on confidentiality, that we put some distinction between accidental and deliberate, because we can see that the gross misconduct is, in other places, it's been classed as deliberate, and it hasn't always been on a confidentiality basis. And the other one was the removal of bullying and harassment at level two, um, and that, that it should just be the level three offence um, that says bullying. Um, so I'm looking for the MX, but it, it's on here, on the other side, isn't it? But it says severe, so basically take out the word severe. Repeated or severe bullying. bullying. Yeah. yeah, it should just be bullying. Okay, so we have all a... Bullying, severe. Okay, do you have a, a second to propose proposed changes? Please ask me, Councillor Howell, yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, members, so we have a proposal in front of us to essentially remove the bullet point around bullying and harassment from level two. Sorry, I will ask Councillor Williams, John Williams, sorry, if he has any thoughts. Yeah, I, I would ask him if he's not to accept that. I, I'm, I'm mindful, I do not want us to, I mean, this is a document that has been approved by the trade unions, it follows ACAS. Um, we are dealing here with examples. I would not want us to make any fundamental changes, and I believe that the, particularly the bullying is a fundamental change to this document. I don't believe that we ought to do that because um, it could compromise our officers. So um, I would rather we stick with what is here. As I say, it's, uh, it meets ACUS and, and follows uh, best practice of ACUS and also has been agreed by the trade unions and therefore, I think we should um, not make that change. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Chairman, with your permission, may I suggest that this particular matter be um, dealt with outside the committee and see if yourself, your the Vice Chairman, and Councillor Williams, and maybe HR can come to some sort of compromise on this, other than just saying it can't or cannot be, because maybe a small amendment on either side, which I think would take too long for us all to think about. Could we, could we, you know, to resolve this issue? Okay, yeah, and I would like some serious HR input into that as well, so. I'm talking with Heather Williams, yeah. <laughs> okay, no, I mean, I'd, I'd be content with that to take that particular point away. Um, so I would like some sort of, you know, serious HR input into this as well, from a, from a legal standing as well. So, um, so presumably you'll be removing your, uh, your proposal there to alter it now. Um, yeah, I think an alteration, so it has my support so long as it's altered. Um, there is, will also shortly be a meeting for the Anti-Bullying Task Committee, which is perhaps only to concur that her chair okay. um, is the one who wants to attend that this session. I'd be happy if that okay. happened. Thank you very much. So I think the decision there is we'll send this report. We won't agree the report today or make a decision on it, at least. We will um, defer it for some minor, minor amendments, minus the points we've just discussed. Um, and then which the eventual sign-off will be by myself and Vice Chair, Councillor Percival. Okay. Well, thank you very much, members, for that. That was uh, probably one of the more exciting items we've had on the uh, employment yeah. agenda before. <laughs> uh, thank you again, officers, for your input there. That was very valuable, so we appreciate it very much. Okay, if there's nothing else, we'll move on to uh, items for information, and we have one, two three quarterly reports to look at. Um, so which officer will be introducing these, please, starting with the retention and turnover? I will be presenting the quarter three uh, retention and turnover report. You've and then I'm doing both quarter four reports. Okay, so you, you've got a quarter each. Yep. Okay, well, um, well, Jonathan, we'll start with you then, please. So the quarter three retention and turnover. Thank you. I'd just like to uh, share my screen because I've um, put together a little presentation. OK. 
Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm currently presenting the quarter three for 2020 to 2021 turnover and retention report. Um, this is to provide an analysis of turnover of staff between the 1st of October and 31st of December last year. Uh, the goal is to highlight trends and inform recruitment decisions and support development of an effective resource strategy to achieve our goals. Um, one of the first parts of the report relating to turnover, I'd like to highlight some of the key trends for you. Um, first of all, the rate of voluntary leavers has been consistently, consistently below uh, target levels of 3.25%, and with the rolling average for the last four quarters showing a steady decline in the number of uh, people leaving the organisation voluntarily. Uh, the most, the areas with the most significant turnover uh, at the moment are shared waste, environment and housing. Um, we have something that we use to measure it called the stability index. Um, our stability index at the moment is 75%, uh, which is unchanged since the previous quarter. And what the stability index means is it's a percentage of people that have been in their current roles for at least a year. So a, a, a rate and index rate of 75% means that 25% of employees have changed roles or left the business since the same quarter last year. This is broadly in line with our target of 80%, which shows we have, there's a balance of progression opportunities and avoiding any excessive turnover. Um, from quarter three, employees could complete an online exit interview with the ability to request a follow-up meeting with HR on the form. Uh, all leavers are prompted at the point that the leavers paperwork is, is submitted to the HR team. And we have a current return rate of 59%, which is much higher than the average for the whole of last year. Um, th and the reason for leaving is a compulsory field. And uh, that we previously were asked about this. Um, some in the report, it mentions that uh, it would give a person the opportunity to say no reason specified for leaving, but this is going to be removed because we'd like to have a better idea of the you know the reasons that people are leaving the business. So. That won't be a factor in uh, future quarters of the report. I would also like to look at uh, recruitment uh, trends, which is highlighted in the most recent report. So the rate of successful recruitment to vacancies remains very high, uh, with 91% of uh, vacancies being recruited on the first attempt in, in this quarter. Uh, no new apprentices started during quarter three, but new opportunities are currently being advertised, and I believe there will also be some further management apprenticeships uh, schemes being introduced over the next uh, you know, few months. Um, we've also had a series of HR induction and onboarding sessions have been introduced uh, in this quarter um, that explains things like flexi time, annual leave and other working practices with follow up meetings two to four weeks later. Uh, HR have also started rolling out a new manager induction training session for newly promoted employees. The whole the goal of this is to ensure that we improve retention across all roles, whether it's someone that might be starting uh, to the council completely new and they haven't had the chance to uh, you know, be in the office and have the experiences of working within their team, but also for people that perhaps are taking on new roles and new responsibilities, making sure they're comfortable and giving them the support required. Um, we had uh, 21 agency staff across all departments and the main place that the agency staff are uh, working is uh, Greater Cambridgeshire Shared Planning, which has 13 agency staff in, in quarter three. We also established a casual worker bank in January 2021, resulting in eight new casual starters, uh, resulting in reduced reliance in agency workers. So the goal is that we reduce them over time by utilising the uh, staff bank more. So we've looked at uh, the comparison of ethnicity statistics at South Cam's District Council, uh, 2019 to 20. Cambridgeshire and Peterborough census data 2011 and East of England census data 2011 show that um, we are officially underrepresented in all ethnicities. But the reason for that is because 10% of employees were not providing uh, in ethnicity data. However, if you look at the proportions involved, uh, black and minority ethnic employees remain underrepresented as a proportion of, of the total. We look, the fact that we've introduced a new HR system relatively recently Will enable reporting on employee profiles much easier than before because we'll be able to it's introduced a um a self-service module where employees can go in and they can update their um the details including ethnicity uh, when they log in 
Uh, finally, I'd like to talk about some of the questions and information requests that were submitted at the uh, previous meeting when the previous um, quarterly report was discussed. So um, point 20 of the quarter three turnover report confirms the number of agency staff per service area, which I've just uh, outlined. And this can be included in future versions of this report going forward if information that's um, required. Uh, the electronic exit interview form has a compulsory question that prompts employees to specify a reason for leaving. Um, we've removed the option to say no reason specified. Uh, the HR team are currently scoping training for all staff to take place over the next 12 months to support our disability competence status. Uh, this should support recruitment and retention of disabled staff and improve representation at the council. Um, in Appendix C, the recruitment and apprenticeships, the table of South Campus District Council of Misty has two separate categories of not disclosed and not provided. Um, not disclosed means that employees actively tick the box that says they would prefer not to say, whilst not provided means that they haven't ticked any boxes. Uh, an additional Appendix E has been added to quarter three report. This is uh, showing a comparison of South Campus District Council with uh, the most recent census data. Obviously, when the new census data is published, we can be able to update that and the comparators will be much more uh, recent. Uh, and finally, the apprentice uh, disability graph from quarter two contained incorrect information. The declaration of no has been removed from the graph for quarter three. Does anyone have any questions about the report? Thank you. Thank you very much for that very comprehensive update, Jonathan. I will ask members now if they have any questions around this particular report for Jonathan. Uh, Heather Williams, please. Thank you. Could I just clarify, you said that there's something in the report that had changed, I thought, and then I didn't quite get what page it was. So that's my, that's my first one. Um, and then on the page 36, the stability um, index, I think that's a really important um, thing for us to be looking at and keeping an eye on because it's not just having the amount of of officers that we need um, we we want to keep that experience um, and quite often we put a lot into people's training etc so it would be interesting to see that and I think very useful for us as a committee and um, to see that on a service provision level um, rather than just overall um, I think that I found it really helpful to have that breakdown on other issues and I think the stability index would be equally as and beneficial in trying to get a a grasp of, um, of the sort of the tension across the council. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, members, anything for me? Hmm? I think there was a question there, Jonathan, from uh, Councillor Williams regarding which page the changes you mentioned were on. Okay. Have a little look at the um, update that I provided. There are a few. There were a few changes that we've made. It wasn't about the um, exit interview, was it? Uh, the reason for leaving that was that's been removed as a potential. Um, it was on apprenticeships you mentioned right at the end. Ah, yes. Um, you, okay. So the, uh, the at the previous meeting, I believe it was raised that um, there was a graph that showed uh, a declaration of no. It was one of the options. It said no. And there was a question over what no actually meant in terms of uh, disability. Um, because I think that there's also um, the, there was also the option to say that a person didn't have any disability. And I believe that a declaration of no, it's just, it was just a mistake on the graph. That's been removed now. Um, the individual's been put into the uh, none category as opposed to no. I believe it was just a, a clerical error. Okay. Thank you. I don't think there are any more questions for you, Jonathan. So, yes, to thank you very much for the report and, uh, and for answering the questions that we had. So, yeah, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. So, we'll move on now to item six. Over to you, Donia. Yep, so the first one I'll talk about is the um, turnover report. So Jonathan talked about quarter three. Um, I am just gonna talk very briefly about quarter four. Um, linking into the point that um, Heather um, 
just made with a stability index, looking at it at service level. Um, that's something that we can go away and look at for the next quarter. Um, it is so using the data in the old system, it was a very manual check. So it will just need to check to see how easy it is to, to get all of that data together. But um, hopefully we should be able to do that. Um, the main themes for quarter four for turnover. Um, the uh, So the rate of levers uh, was really, really, really minimal. Um, and I, I'm saying really, really, really because it, it was very, uh, very low. So we only had seven levers in the quarter, um, which is um, looking at quarter, looking provisionally at quarter one data. It looks like quarter four might more have been um, an anomaly as opposed to um, the, the start of a downward trend. Um, the, the report itself goes into turnover by uh, service area um, and the stability index figure we've got for quarter four uh, is, uh, has increased to 91%. Um, so that's compared to uh, the uh, figure that Jonathan uh, mentioned in quarter three. Um, and then the kind of expanding on the exit interview forms. Um, so last year, um, it might have even been this time last year, we started, um, we moved away from line managers doing the exit interviews, which, which traditionally um, the how many we received was, uh, was a mixed bag. Um, we made it an online form for HR to send out the link as soon as we know someone's leaving. Um, because of, we've now had two or three quarters worth of data, we can see that the amount of exit interviews we're getting back is going up, but it's still quite low. So it's still in the 50, like 50 percent bracket. Uh, what we've decided to introduce from now, so uh, from July 2021, um, is for um, HR to individually approach um, every lever. Um, as in an advisor or a business partner make contact with them to do the exit interview as opposed to passively giving someone an exit interview form and assuming that they will um, they will receive it. So we would hope that that would have another, um, um, we would have more, more people uh, completing the exit interviews, which means we'd obviously have better data and then can make decisions um, based on that. Um, and I think, let me just... The, uh, so the, there is a, a change in quarter four report. We put more detailed information around the exit interviews. Um, and so point uh, 11 um, in the report um, then also includes um, the two questions from the exit interview form itself, which allows us to see that the trend of what people are saying about how do you rate the following with South Cambridgeshire District Council and would you consider working for the council again? So we've added that information in. Um, the, uh, my, my question, um, if I can ask the question to you all, would be if you found that information useful, because we don't want to include this in the report if you don't find it useful, but if you find it useful, then we can have it in there for next quarter. Um, and I think... Um, recruitment. Um, Jonathan's already updated about friendships and looking at the friendships for this year. Um, the Casual Worker Bank, um, just to expand on what Jonathan already said, um, has been quite a success since it's introduced. By having the Casual Worker Bank, it means that we're going to reduce our agency fees, uh, which is obviously uh, better for the council. Um, and that is that is the end of the um, retention and turnover report for quarter four. Thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be a few questions. Uh, Councillor, sorry, go on. Thank you. Page 58. Um, I am very glad to see this information on the exit interviews um, because it was one of the things that we um, looked at in the recruitment and retention working party. Um, and I know that there was a, a, a really a deliberate attempt to um, increase the number of exit interviews t uh, done and also the quality of the information coming from them. So I think it's really good to see that here and I'd welcome that information being given to each meeting. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, on um, page 68, there is um, the SEDC ethnicity count and overall percentages. Um, I'm just asking, and I, I don't expect an answer today, 
Um, but um, just how do we compare against what our local statistics are? Are we up, down, in different? We must be, I would be very surprised if we're all spot on in every single different category. So how, how do we fare? Thank you, Don. Thank you. Don, is that something that we can take away and look at, how we compare to neighbouring authorities? Um, I can certainly so sorry, look Sarah. to find so out the information um, and see how it might compare to either the city or other local authorities. Um, it would be dependent on them, I guess, releasing uh, the information to us, but I can look into that. That's not a problem. I'm so sorry, Chairman. I don't mean compared to other local authorities. I mean, how oh, okay. are we compared to our population of South Cambridgeshire? Okay. Right, okay. Approximately, yep. I mean, if you want to go a bit wider, it, it doesn't bother me, but what I'm trying to say is, how, do, how, how is this in comparison to our particular population? Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Is that, Donya, how easy is yeah, that information yeah. to get? So, that, uh, just bear with me one second, let me open it up. Um, the report that Jonathan um, used um, c did um, compare to the census information from 2011. So that's that's all I can say. We compare it, we can compare it to the 2011 data, and we'll be able to do that uh, pretty straightforwardly. But obviously, that's ten that's now ten years out of date. Yeah. Um, so it would be a case of looking at when the new uh, the new census data comes in. Um, us obviously updating it and doing that, but I can I can do that. That's not a problem. Um, I can probably um, compare them both on my screen now and just give you a rough idea if you'd like, like the information right this second or if you want me to Lord, wait for later. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm fine with waiting. It's just, I don't think we can cheat on the user census. I mean, there must be other fairly reliable data we can use, not just the census. But, you know, just an approximation would be fine, just so okay. we don't beat in ourselves up or we should be working harder in particular areas. That's what um, I'm more looking at than, than uh, okay. the user. Thank okay. you, Chairman. Is that something that can be taken away, don't you? Yes, that's, that's great, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. Um, I'd echo the comments made by Councillor Dornton about the usefulness of the uh, information on page 58. I think um, that is very helpful to see. Um, I, and just one question relating to page 57. I just note that we've um, had a redundancy. Just want to, to be assured that um, that's a per one off and when there aren't any foreseen redundancies in the future. Thank you. Um, I, I can't speak for, so at the moment we've got a change programs happening across the council. Um, so I don't have um, a, a definitive answer. That was a one off redundancy um, for, for one individual for one particular role. Um, but in terms of if there are any further ones across the council, I think um, Susan would be best placed to know that information. Thank you. Any more questions? No? Okay, well, that's all the questions, Donya. So thank you very much for the report. Um, I believe you're still in the spotlight yes, for the next report. Me. Okay, let me just get the other um, report up. Sorry. So Thanks. this this one is the sickness absence. Yes. Um, okay. Um, so again, this is quite a detailed report. So I'll, I'll just kind of uh, skim through the key points. Really, um, sickness for quarter four uh, dropped significantly. Um, again, I'm going to kind of bring it up to date in terms of with quarter one data um, to say that it looks like again as it was for turnover, um, sickness also seems to be an anomaly. Um, for, for this. Uh, so our sickness does seem to have increased significantly um, in the, in the quarter one. Um, so I guess a few points um, around the, the, the sickness uh, dipping in quarter four. It did also, uh, that compared to how sickness absence uh, fell um, in the UK as a whole. Um, so it fell to 1.8% at the end of 2020, as I've stated in the report. Um, and um, the other kind of biggish theme, uh, I guess, is that in terms of knowing the information about coronavirus, um, the amount of absences that we have had in the council um, compared to um, the amount of uh, absences um, that coronavirus has taken across the across the UK, um, generally our, our, our numbers for coronavirus are really, really low. So that means um, that you know, one of the reasons might just be um, because South Cambridge, we've got lower levels than the rest of the country. 
um, or it might speak to the fact that, you know, obviously people are home, home working, so, so things aren't spreading as much. But then um, it, it, I guess it's just an interesting point to note because you would think um, uh, COVID might be, um, you know, a, a quite significant reason for absence. But at the moment, touch wood, um, it isn't. And hopefully it, it kind of stays like that uh, for the council. Um, the top the top four of, oh, sorry, I've got a bit of feedback. Can I carry on talking? I can yeah. hear you fine. We can hear you fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay, fine. Sorry about that. Um, so the top four reasons for absence um, are uh, stress, depression and mental health, stomach, liver, kidney and digestion, um, other um, and heart, blood pressure and circulation. Um, and they're different. The, the kind of top three or four normally stays roughly the same. But it, this for this quarter, it seems to have um, changed up a little bit. But that might also be because of absence falling. Um, so um, falling to such a low level. Um, so there are quite a few graphs there in terms of breaking down um, absence uh, from a long term, short term point of view and days lost to stress, depression and mental health. Um, and um, that information we've covered. Um, so one point to notice at the very, very end of the um, report, um, we've included the information around um, access to our employee assistance programme. Um, so we had 14 employees access the CBT resources, um, which is, is, you know, is, is still at 14 more, uh, obviously, than none. But um, it is a drop from compared to quarter three. Um, two employees had telephone assessments for counselling and 16 telephone counselling sessions took place. So, so that doesn't necessarily mean 16 individual employees. It just means 16, uh, 16 sessions. Um, so hopefully the kind of that information gives you um, a kind of a bit of a more more of a context to the sickness absence that's it that's the end of the report so unless there's any questions yep thank you very much for the update um and yeah before we open up questions just to say the the numbers on the amount of days lost to covid isolation are actually really interesting from my point of view so i know obviously the covid figures weren't included um prior in the um in the sickness results or the sickness figures so you know i think it's actually useful for, for us as a committee to see how many days we're actually losing and you know quite scarily for the waste service how much how many days they're losing yeah. due to uh, due to covid isolation um i'll just go on to okay um i don't think we uh, we don't normally have an age profile uh, with these reports but that might be helpful in relation to um the absence of reasons for absence okay so um you'd want a cross check so reasons for absence um, and if there's any trends with age groups. Um, I, I can certainly ask that question um, from my colleague who's doing this quarter's report and see what we can look at. Thank you, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. Um, I agree, I think it would be useful on the, on the age profiles. And I know we've raised it before. I think the response that was given to STEM was um, that it could identify individuals, particularly in the smaller surface area. So I, I think the age groups would be helpful, but we probably couldn't go into a, um, a sort of a service provision section. So I'm, I'm supportive of what Councillor Daunty said, it, as long as the figures are sort of generic across the board. Mm. So no one we've discussed it before, because you, you have sometimes you've seen before people seem to be yeah. easily identifying someone. So as long as it's not service breakdown, then then I think that would be very helpful. Sure. Okay. No, I didn't ask you across the board, just general. Um, I can't hear you. Um, yes, I'm, I, I was only asking for it generally, not broken down by service. Okay. Any further questions, members, on this report? No, I don't think we have. So, Donia, thank you very much. I appreciate the, uh, the report there. And I think there's a few things to take away for the, uh, for the next meeting we have in three months' time. Thank you very much. So we move on to item eight, members, which I think would have been an update from, from the Disability and Confident Task, Disability Confident Task and Finish group, uh, which would have been done by Susan, but unfortunately, obviously, she isn't here today. So what I might do, I might ask um, Councillor Jim Johnson, who heads it up, to write a written update of where exactly we are, and if she could circulate that to, to myself and then around the committee, I think that would be more useful. Albeit, I don't think it has actually moved on uh, at all since, since our last meeting. 
but uh, I will ask Councillor Chin Johnson if she would mind circulating something for our benefit. Um, members, I think that is everything we have on the agenda today. So I just say, remind everyone our next meeting is currently on Friday the 15th of October. Um, and I'll say thank you very much to our officers who have made the time today. We appreciate your input. And thank you very much, members, for, for your input as well. And with that, I will close the meeting, Patrick. Thank you.